This is Annabelle Gaberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative. My chance to talk with professionals in the creative industries, to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers, what relationships influence their work. Today's episode is brought to you by Crefervy, our London and Paris-based law firm focused on advising creative industries. Subscribe to our podcast Lawfully Creative or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube and SoundCloud. Hello podcast listeners, this is our first podcast of 2017. Happy New Year! On the 19th of January, I caught up with my buddy Carlos Nieto, who was introduced to me by the guys from The Orchard, the music aggregator based in New York City and recently acquired by Sony. Carlos is a very seasoned player in the music industry and relocated a few years ago in France from Miami to, among other things, set up a young and innovative music service company as it is described on his website guitarmusic.com in order to service the needs of right holders in the music industry. Carlos is today an expert in relation to administration services and collection management and improving the transparency for the collection of rights in the neighbouring rights and publishing rights spheres. So here is the gist of our meeting and conversation when we caught up at the Prince de Galles Hotel in Paris on the 19th of January. Enjoy! And thank you for listening to Lawfully Creative. Carlos, nice to see you again. Nice lovely, to see you again. Nice to catch up with you in the new year for my first uh, podcast of 2017. For how long have you been working in the music industry then? I've been working in the music industry since 1985. 1985? 85, yes. You're a veteran. <laughs> <laughs> I was 10. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I think you explained to me when we caught up at the Medem in Cannes last year that your background was sort of more technical initially as an engineer and then you moved away from that and went into business affairs, a bit like Richard Kirstein when she trained to be a clarinetist and then um, and then started to do some uh, music production work and things. Yeah, basically what happened, uh, you know, I, I was going to the university to study music, that was my first uh, okay. intention. While being in a university, I moved from the music aspect of things into the music and production and engineering side. Were you, were you and, in the uh, States? Yeah. Which yeah. university? At uh, Boston and uh, Berkeley College of Music. Okay, fabulous. Well done. While you were there, this is where you saw that you had more interest in sort of more commercial aspects of music? or It, it came about as a, a bit of a surprise. I was finishing up the music aspect and I didn't know if I should continue on that path or if I should change into another field within the same university and I was basically looking at my options. Uh, the first options were obviously like conducting and uh, music composition but then one day I went by the department uh, of music production and engineering and okay. I met with the dean of, uh, of the department kind of realized that I I was always interested in the music production and in the engineering aspects of the making of the albums and that's how I decided to change and after talking to him he advised me on how to proceed because it was actually basically under the same university they didn't really have like a, a program as a master's program or anything like that so it would be a matter of kind of like starting from scratch mm -hmm. so what they did is that they accepted everything they had done before and I went straight into the courses that had to deal with music and production and engineering. So, and that change, that switch happened when? After two or three years into your course After at Berkeley? After three or? years. Wow, well, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's like almost a bachelor's degree level. And what, which instruments, musical instruments were you playing? I was playing flute at the flute? time. Flute? Yeah. I'm also a flutist. <laughs> oh, really? Like that? Uh, yeah, I, I was playing flute and um, yeah, I, was, I was getting pretty good. Uh, nice. But uh, at the same time, I was not so much into the uh, competition of the instructor, other students, and I was getting a little sick of the practicing and rehearsing every day, and rehearsing yeah, every day you know, five, four, or six hours, hours a day. I was a little fatigued with, with that, so I decided to change, and it was a good change because, uh, first, I had a lot of fun. 
and we were kind, we, we fell into kind of like a, the experimental time of the university because they were trying to move the program into a certain direction. We had a lot of teachers who were kind of like experimenting into how to evolve the program at the same time. So we were like the second or third group that were there when the program was actually named Music Production and Engineer. My, um, I remember my flute teacher because I started uh, playing the flute and I was eight, nine years old. And when I turned around 11, she told me, you know, you, you could be a professional flottist. I was 11 and I said to her, nah, it's not enough money to be made in that. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer to work on the business side of things. And also I did notice that it was a super competitive world and that only the very selected few uh, succeed because there aren't many job placements for, for a flute player, flute. no. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. You've got uh, Jean-Pierre Rampal, uh, who was um, obviously very famous in the noughties as a jazz flautist and some others like Irish flautists usually, but I saw, I, I didn't really see the point of becoming a professional flautist. I mean, I, I, to have a fulfilling career for a long time. I mean, there was Emmanuel Pahu as well and you know, it was, a, it was a, like, it was like it's a, a very difficult star. field and it's very narrow. Yeah, what it, happens? Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's uh, my, the, point you only it. have a very few. I mean, you have, uh, in, in an orchestra, you only have like three posts. Basically, you have to uh, wait until somebody either moves up or exactly. somebody dies before yeah. you can take on their position. I don't, think yeah. I, I don't think I was that talented anyway. I don't think I was that gifted. I, I think I studied even too late at um, around 10, 11. So. Well, that happened to me too. I started late with the flute. Yeah. So, and and that made it more difficult. You know, if if, if I had started when I was like six or seven, you exactly. know, but I started when I was like fourteen. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah. and that made it really difficult in comparison to a lot of the, you know, schoolmates that I had. So, how long did you stay at Berkeley in total? In total, I was there five years. And Name then, that. And then what happened? Then by a fluke. I ended up in Miami, in Florida. When I got there, I, it wasn't my intention at the beginning to stay there, but once I got there, I realized I had to stay for a little bit. What I ended up doing was going to the studio, a studio called Criteria Recording, Criteria Recording Studios, which, which was like a huge complex uh, made out of five studios and uh, really famous in the States. Uh, they always had like big names recording there. The Bee Gees had recorded there, Eric Clapton, Aretha, Frank. So I interviewed and I started as an intern because everybody in that area starts as an intern. Yeah. So I was an intern for about three months and then um, little by little I started getting jobs as an assistant engineer. Uh, so that was in a recording studio or was that in yeah, a label? In a recording studio. In a recording yeah. studio, okay. Yeah. Were you influenced by the, um, I watched uh, last year, the Muscle Shoals uh, film, documentary, I don't know if you... I haven't you seen have it, heard, you must have heard but, of Muscle Shoals. but what's funny is that Muscle Shoals was always kind of compared to Criteria where I worked right. in Miami because they both had the same feel. There were studios that were isolated from the rest of the country. You know, while most of the studios were located in Los Angeles or New York, yeah, these two studios were located like totally. Yeah, in Mississippi. Uh, yeah, Criteria benefited from some of, some of the same characteristics. They had people who worked. Uh, not for the studio, but people who did like session work and they were always kind of like the same group uh, but not like, you know, contrary to LA and New York where you have tons of musicians that, you know, even though the the, the group of studio musicians it's remains small, obviously in Florida it was a lot smaller right. and uh, so it was limited to a very few guys. Was it influenced by a, a, a very strongly Cuban music catalog? No, no, was it like all, all, all genres? No, at the time when I got there, the market for the studio was basically about 80% Anglo music and okay. uh, there was like a 20% of Latin American music. Nothing to do with Cuba, it was just basically big artists from most signed to major companies who were recording there either because they moved there. Like uh, Iggy Pop is, <laughs> is, is based in Miami now. Yeah. 
but he came after my time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The ratio was sort of like that. It was more of a, an American scene, and there were a lot of British that would come to the studio because it was located in Florida, and they wanted to be at the beach. But then, slowly but surely, the whole the equation started to change as the city. You know, changed in terms of demography. The clients at the studio changed also. So, well, the clients changed because you know, as a lot of people, more people started to move into the city, more Latin people. Then the studio changed. You know, a lot of the clients changed basically. Okay. And, so uh, it became more Latin music focused. The, the, then the ratio would actually. Uh, I think at one time it was like 80, 20, 80 Latin American recording uh, right. percent of American clients. So we were looking at what the mid. Eighties when you were there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then did you move into late nineties? Oh, so you stayed there around ten years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, more than that. More okay, than that. Yeah. Solid. That's yeah. Solid. Experience. Yeah, because then after becoming an assistant engineer, I moved into, I started doing sessions, you know, independently, the where I became the engineer. I see. And, you know, I did a few productions here and there. Nothing. You never thought about uh, launching your own label? No, not at the time. Okay. No, I was just basically interested in, in the recording aspect. And I took a lot of time. You know, a lot of the projects were long projects that lasted like four, three months, six months. So you were freelance? Yeah, I was freelance. Criteria. I was okay. freelance. So then but, after Criteria and the the 15 years in Miami, what did you do? Yeah, I was in Miami up until 2010. I started, I was getting a little tired of the recording scene. I got married, I, I had kids, and finding myself working until like six o'clock in the morning. I was always going against the clock and I got against the, the, so, so the were, normal current that people live there. And uh, So you were working like all night? Until six. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they were working, re recording at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of the recordings with these artists, they took place. They started like at four o'clock in the afternoon, and what? we worked at, because that's how they work. Are oh, they working the night? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because of all the live sessions they've been doing, so they took the. Uh, no, 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 no. They work at. They work. They start late in the afternoon because they feel that in the morning they don't have the same um, creativity. Okay. <laughs> That's basically it. And, yeah. so, and then they jam, I'm like, they work until all night. Some, some worked all night. Some started like at two o'clock in the afternoon and we worked until 10 o'clock at night. Uh, some worked until two o'clock in the morning, you know, and every once in a while we, we would get like a crazy session that would last three days straight, no sleep. Uh, Come on. It was pretty crazy sometimes. I found myself, you know, pretty much living a situation where I was going against everything against my kids and, you and I, to have some other priorities. I, yeah and I started to think well maybe I should change and while I was thinking about this I met a friend of mine with whom I worked on the recording side mm -hmm. we met in the studio while I was doing a session and he was doing another session and we were like in the lobby and we started talking I asked him I said don't you have anything that I that we could do together you know you need help in some aspect that we could work together that I what can... What was he doing, this guy? Also, he, music well, engineering? He, he was a producer, but he was also a writer. Okay. Yeah, he was also a composer, and he was writing a lot of big hits for a lot of Latin American artists, and he was like on his way up. He was, uh, at the time, as a matter of fact, he was signed as a writer for the publishing company of Emilia Stefan, you know, the husband of Gloria Stefan. He was doing well, but he was producing some albums too. When we met and we started talking about this, it was really funny because he said, well, you know, I have this thing that I have all these writers around me and I don't know what to do with them. They send me demos, you know, some of them are people that I know, that I've known for a long time. I know that some of them are really talented, but I don't know what to do with them. She just didn't have the time to deal right, with right, it. Right, right. So uh, I, I told him, I said, well, let's do this. I'll come over to your place and I'll see what you have and, and uh, I don't know, well, I'll see what, what I can do. So I basically went to his place. He had like really tons of demos in all sorts of media, CDs, cassettes, DATs, I mean, you name it. And basically... Why was he keeping the whole stuff? Must be so, you know, space consuming. No, no, he was keeping it because uh, he was interested in in some of the stuff that people were sending him because okay. some of the stuff is actually pretty good. Right. But he just didn't have the time to put it all together or to make any sense out of it. Right, right, right. And basically, I just went to his place for you know a few days and I sat down and I started listening to everything and I started kind of like making a log 
of everything that I was listening to and classifying it by genres and by composer and making like mp3 files of everything. Then when everything was uh, really shaping into like a group of composers that, that, you know, obviously we had to filter, you know, and weed out some of the stuff that was not really worthy, that left the group 35 to 45 writers, you know, some of which have or had uh, lots of songs, you know, 20 plus, and some had like one or two or three. But it was but, but, it, that they, but they, they were good. Yeah. And so what basically I proposed to, to him was, you know, maybe we can do something with this. Maybe we can put together like some sort of publishing company where we pitch the stuff to the artists that you work with or the people that you know, because, you know, they come asking for you, not only as a producer, but also as a writer. And, you know, you can't write for everybody, you know, you don't, you're, you won't have the time, but perhaps we can do like some sort of collaboration where you take some of these songs that are like maybe halfway or three quarters of the way and you complete them and that way uh, you pitch them yourself you know and I can and I can filter of some you, of the stuff. You, you made this with consent of the uh, primary right owners, the people who had written those songs? At first no. Oh my god. No, 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 because at first all these guys knew him. That's and they enough. and they all knew that they had sent him, you know, the material. Right. And nothing had really materialized in terms of agreements or in terms of um, of pitching. The, the, it was just a matter of like making like a library. Okay. Once the library materialized, and he realized that he could do something with it, he started talking to some of them, saying, "Okay, let's do this. You know, uh, you have this song. Let's see if we can work." together on this song and I'll try to pitch it, you know, and if somebody picks it up, then, then we'll deal with it, you know, because a lot of these people were friends of his and uh, so there was like a, a really good relationship with pretty much all of them. But one day I thought that, you know, we, we, we need to take this a step higher. We've taken advantage of his reputation. Mm -hmm. I, I put together like a package based on what he had done as a writer and what he could do as a publisher. I, I went to LA and I met with a few people. Funny enough, I met the head of uh, Famous Music, which was the publishing branch of Paramount Pictures. Very nice guy. You know, I went to his office and it was, and it was really strange because I went to his office not really expecting much. He heard that we were doing this through a common friend and he said, ah, oh, bring them over. Maybe, we, you know, I, I'm interested in hearing what they're doing and whatever. So I explained in a meeting that we had what, what we were doing and what the idea was. I also presented like the package, you know, where I had everything that this guy had done, everything that I had done on my side. You know, the package had like, it was sort of like a resume of what we have been working on. But especially on this guy's uh, side, because he was like the writer and he was like the one who was attracting the artists to record with him, to do the productions and to do the, the, the compositions. The head of Paramount, uh, the head of Famous, he said uh, that he was interested and well that he would put together like a plan on how we could do it together. So in the end, the plan materialized. Sorry, that would be to put some of these tracks into films. Is that right? That would be to actually... No, 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 because the, the, the publishing branch that they had was not only for films. Oh, okay. No, so it was for anything. Oh, right, okay, so that's a publishing yeah. branch. I'm sure that when it, when it started, okay. it, 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 it might have started as the branch to deal with the, with the music for films. The synchronization, yeah. But then uh, when, I, when I met them, they, they had branched out into a full blown publishing company where they had writers signed right. to the company and okay. everything. So basically the deal materialized into a co-publishing deal, you know, where we were going Beautiful. half and half. And, and, um, and, and basically they were providing the support. They were providing the lawyers, obviously, and they were providing the royalty management and the licensing and all that. All we had to worry about was the creative side. And uh, so it was, really, it was really cool. And I, and I worked for a few years. What was really nice is that I had the chance to work with their lawyer, a guy by the name of Ken Clavins, who was magnificent, who had some amazing contracts. What was his uh, name again? Kent Clavins. 
He was in LA. He was based in LA. Great. He was a super nice guy. He was very helpful. I thought his contracts were amazing. They were super clear. They were well written. They were they were fully protected. The writer and also the publisher, obviously. Yeah. And um, what happened was that. While working with him, obviously I learned a lot just by reading the agreement, just by working with him, uh, exposing ourselves to different situations because all the writers had different things that they had to deal with. So we were dealing with advances, we were dealing with songs that were written with other people who were from other publishers, yeah. you know, so that gave way to a, a big sort of uh, agreement land where we had agreements of all types. I'd completely forgotten the fact that you actually um, were a publisher for some time between the sound engineering experience and the, uh, the Collecting Society work, so thanks for ref refreshing my m memory about this. So you really did see quite a lot of sides to the business. Yeah, we. Uh, I, w I had the chance to, to look at the business from a different angle. Maybe what was exciting was to learn as much as I could from these guys because these guys were like top pros and uh, well, a paramount. Yeah, it, Hollywood. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, but yeah, it was Hollywood. <laughs> You're right, it was, Ho it was Hollywood. But they were super, where were they based? Were they based in they were based in LA? Uh, they were based because their offices were like a bit towards West. These are guys that had like a tremendous amount of experience, uh, obviously, sure. a lot older than I was at the time. It was a great experience, and I learned a lot from them, and that gave way for me to move into uh, you know a different world something that I hadn't uh, considered before and then so basically when I left how long did you do this for with the co-publishing co work with uh, Paramount and this guy um, Esteban? I, remember, I think it was like four years and then I left they continued for a while deal ended and then uh, famous music got sold and you know for millions of dollars at one point uh, Esteban sold the catalog no 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 the famous music the catalog of Paramount Pictures got sold. I guess that's yeah. that's when the deal that, that, that we created ended. So in the meantime I moved to another publisher through a writer that I had met while doing this. He was friends with another publisher. That publisher was looking for somebody to handle his stuff and I moved to that company. Uh, still in LA or by No, I, by, still in, in my An independent uh, label of uh, Latin music mainly from the Dominican Republic, I'd say 90% from the Dominican Republic. I had never been that much into that type of music, and it was quite interesting because it was a big operation. They had a huge catalog of compositions. What was it called? Uh, it's called JNN Records. Two brothers that own the label, and uh, they've had it for a while. I mean, it's a label that's been in business for like 30-something years. Was it a label or was it a publishing company or both? Uh, both. They were in need of somebody to handle the publishing side, so I took upon it. It worked out to be a great experience too, because then I got to use all that I had learned with these guys from Famous and what this lawyer Ken Clavins and everything. I got the opportunity to to use it on my own without supervision. <laughs> I was totally in control of everything and obviously there were a lot of things that I had to learn you know they, they had their own uh, royalty uh, calculation software which I had not done all the licensing was done by us all the contracts were, were done by us and little by little when I started they had somebody who was helping with the with the agreements you know somebody who worked out of New York a legal person there but when I started this person told me kind of like on my way out so whatever you can you know you can do on your own or whatever experience you can gain from what I'm doing you know go ahead because I'm eventually gonna leave so little by little I started making also library of agreements of licenses so next thing I knew I was handling all their licenses all their legal agreements so you were totally the, business affairs by then yeah by then I was totally you know immersed into the business and legal affairs it moved also into the artistic side I was doing both I was doing the publishing side but at the same time I was doing all the artist agreements, all the master licenses, um, uh, all of that. Uh, yeah, so you're like almost like totally working as a lawyer? A lot of the time, yes, I was working pretty much as a lawyer because... Oh, you didn't train as a lawyer? Oh, no, I never trained as a lawyer. So all, uh, all her learn on the job. Yeah. I was still back in Miami and did you work with uh, J&N <laughs> until 2010? Yes, but 
after I moved uh, here to Paris, I still worked uh, for them for another two years, so 2012. So what prompted the move to Paris? How did that come about? I wanted a change, wanted something better for my kids. Really? Miami was yeah. not good anymore? It depends how you look at it. No, Miami is a lot of fun, you know. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. It's got great beaches and everything, but yeah. uh, it's sunny all the time. But in terms of culture, in terms of values that I wanted my kids to have, I, I needed a change. But this whole thing about, about friends came as, as a fluke. It came as a surprise. Well, why did you select Paris? It wasn't so much that I selected Paris uh, at first. The, one of the things that I was doing for this company was that I was dealing with all their master licenses and all the statements that had to do with the master licenses. And they had a huge catalog of masters. And a lot of those licenses had to deal with uh, companies in Europe. One day, one of the companies, they called me up they, in regards to one of these licenses and as I was chatting with one of the guys that I had met had met him I asked him what do you think of me going to Europe and, and working there uh, doing something what 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 comes to mind when I when I tell you this and he said oh I think this would be wonderful you can come to France and you can serve as a liaison between us and the companies there because we don't we know nothing we're always in the dark we don't know who does what and this guy was what what was he doing it was he a licensee it, he was a licensee right so he had some deals with uh, with labels in france for example and he was he worked he works for a label here right right, right. And, and and so he, he thought that the guys of his label in France were like not transparent. No, no, it wasn't so much that. Well, I guess what he meant at the beginning was that uh, I guess he was referring mainly to Latin music. Where he was saying when we want to oh, okay. do something, license a track, pay the right people. We are pretty much in the dark because oh, okay. we we were not there. We don't know anybody. Yeah, uh, it's a and, Yeah, but the way he put it, he he kind of said you know, that it would be really advantageous for me to come to France and do the same thing that I did over there but kind of like on the opposite side and help move those catalogs of Latin music here in France. It's you, funny you didn't mention London because huh? the know, entertainment could, capital in Europe <laughs> is London. Is London, yeah. I, I took upon his idea and I started doing a little research but this is within days. I mean. Uh, I spoke to him like in March. By April, I kind of had an idea of what could be done. And I came to Paris for about two weeks to find out if what I had in mind was actually feasible. I figured that something could be done. And at the same time, I was finding out through the, the French consulate in Miami if there was a way for me to go to France with some sort of a special visa. Because I figured, well, you know, this is kind of like a special talent if you want to think of it that way. There's got to be something, uh, some sort of visa. And sure enough, when I found out there was one, and when they sent me what was required to obtain the visa, it, it became clear that what I had seen in the two weeks in Paris was actually matchable to what they were requiring on the visa. What do you mean by that? Do well, that, 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 well, that they were requiring a project basically okay you know so within the project you had to state okay what are you going to do and where are you going to get the money from so that's what i did i presented a project and like a business plan yeah it was like a business plan where i said you. well this is you know when i get there this is what i'm going to do i'm going to create my company and i'm going to register with all these societies right, and then right, i'm right. going to work you know the opposite way and i started showing also because since I had access to like statements and stuff from Europe, I started showing those as a means to 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 portray what I was going to do. I, I see what you mean doing it from the other side. Your plan was to stop being on the publishing side, but just making more the, the, the whole thing more transparent for licensees and publishers and labels, um, which had that catalog of Latin America by basically being on the ground in France and just liaising with the collecting societies and getting all the money in and stuff like that. Is that, yeah. is that what you meant? You yeah. already had that plan. Yeah. You know, when I saw the fact that I had to present the business plan, it became clear to me that it would have to be something serious and there would have to be something where I, where I was sure that there would be some revenue. It wasn't so much leaving the publishing side because I, I'm still doing it. 
Yeah. It's just that I'm doing it from the uh, as a sub publisher by representing catalogs, publishing catalogs here in France. Yeah, but yeah, those yeah. these catalogs are from basically the states and some other countries. Is it all Latin music that um, now you are? In? What I represent, yeah, I would say, is 85% Latin 85. music. Yeah. Okay. Did you sort of see a niche here in this, especially rising of? Streaming um, income coming through. Did you did you see that there was a niche that there was follow yes. the money? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> by, by being this sort of liaison officer between the, the collecting societies on the ground here, uh, which obviously only speak French and are very understaffed, and also your clients who are most of the time, I suppose, based in um, either North America or South America. Perhaps. Yeah, that was basically it. That was basically, I saw the niche. You saw the niche. Also because. At the time, uh, there were a few tracks from the catalogs that, uh, that I, of people that I knew you right. know, back in the States that were working here. That in were France. actually, yeah, that were doing well in the charts. For example, there was a huge uh, search of, for example, bachata music in, yeah, in France. Yeah. You know, I, where you would hear bachata music and the everywhere. And La Lombada, La Lombada as well, La Lombada. When, when I was a teenager, so corny. Right away, that showed me that, you know, all that revenue from performance had to be going somewhere. And, and so uh, what was happening with it? Well, some of it was being collected, but a lot of it was just being lost or was being retained because they didn't know who to pay. Because yes, a lot of these people the were not even represented here. Right. And what happens is that on the publishing side, yes, you have portion of it that can leap from country to country. But, you know, it wasn't me who invented the sub-publishers. Sub-publishers have been in business for a long time yeah. and they're in business for a reason. And the reason is that when you have a sub-publisher, you make more money because your songs, your compositions are better represented because... When you have a sub-publisher? Yeah, by all means. So if you rely on your society in your country of origin, all you have control over is the fact that you're going to register the song. Once they're registered, you have no control whatsoever if the songs are being played in other countries, you have no idea, you have no way of matching uh, songs that are being registered with what's being played. So, and that's all the work that as a publisher does, you know, it's not only registering your catalog, first of all, make sure that it's 100% registered. And, and there's ways of doing that, there's ways of making sure that you have everything registered, not only what's being played or what's the, right. the, the most popular song of your catalog. You're talking about the soundtracks here, as well as the... Uh the, the copyright, the, the, the yeah. publishing? Well, when I mean when I say register, I mean registering the songs that the society, the songs, yes, 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 yes. Uh, the compositions. Yeah, Even when I was yeah. in the States and I had some publishers that were doing the work here, I noticed that they were only interested in the tracks that were most popular. Right. And which to me has always been an error on the side of a publisher and on the side of us a publisher. Why? Because the publishing business is a business of the drop. Okay. You know, it's the constant drop. drop. Like tiny incomes, yeah. Yeah. Every once in a while you have something big that makes it, yeah. you know, especially in other territory. It's, it's the full catalog what really gives you the edge over just doing it yourself. Yeah, let's say. all the time. Uh, because that way, if you make sure that all your catalog is registered, if the sub-publisher is doing the work of identifying unclaimed tracks on your behalf, not only by knowing the writers, you, you have to know the performer. You can't just search by songs by using the writer. You'll, you're not going to find anything. Because most of the reports that come from the entities that pay the societies here in Europe, which is a difference that exists for between Europe and the States, because in the States, all the societies collect this performance. Yes. They don't collect mechanical rights. Yeah. Uh, here in Europe, they collect both. But basically, with the sub-publisher, that's what, that's what happens. The societies here, they collect everything. So a lot of the reports that come from the uh, internet stores, you know, iTunes, Amazon, Deezer, Spotify, whatever, yeah. they come with the artists. I see. Oh yes, of course, it's not going to be catalogued by the right. songwriter. So a lot of the times the society has no clue whatsoever how to match. But don't they use a sort of number of a track? Like they find a, a number to uh, no. identify a track? No. 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 As you come to France and you are now representing um, as a sub-publisher but also as, as a uh, manager of all these copyright um, 
publishing rights. I, I am under the impression that you are also regist registering locally all those songs. Yes. Yes. You, so, of course, they are registered, uh, say, for example, with uh, CISAC or uh, BMI or, uh, or ASCAP in the, or ASCAP States. In the yeah. US, which is the main collective society, but you make a point of registering all these songs and musical compositions in France as well with yes. Uh, CSM. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's what happens exactly. You have to make sure that when you sign a, a self-publishing deal that you know, even if they have 10,000 works, you have to make sure that all 10,000 works are registered. Uh, and there's, there's ways of knowing if the 10,000 works have been registered. Right. And, and that, because that's what gives the edge of the drop. That's yeah. what's gonna bring, you know, the steady income. And then you have to move into the process of really recognizing the tracks, of, of recognizing the songs by writer, by artist, by... Do you use the, uh, do you remember I introduced you to that um, lady from BMAT? Which I think is, is exactly that. They are they're based uh, in, in Spain, you know. Yeah, but BMAT it's a great company because they're 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 doing a service to everybody. I think it's free. Uh, yeah. For, for most people. But but even better is that they're reaching deals with the societies. Yes. Uh, right. In order to match what they have yes. as content. With, with what's been uh, reported to the society. Yeah. And I think also you have a sort of uh, identifying tool where you can identify... Well, they have a lot of uh, algorithms to, okay. to actually match the music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they have to do with the wavelength of the song, okay. uh, how the song looks, and uh, it's a really complicated uh, yeah. software that they use. But it's, it's doing wonders to a lot of people because... It's, Is it useful for you? I don't know yet. You don't know. I don't know yet. It was actually, it's been implemented on the master side uh, recently here in France. I see. Yeah. So uh, I think we're going to start seeing the results probably uh, in a year, year and a half. Uh, Miki, Miki Tsunis from The Orchard speaks very highly of uh, BMAT. So. Yeah, because they're perfect. For on that. the neighboring right side, though. Yeah, because they're perfect for that. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, the orchard being a digital distributor, they have access to all the, 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 the audio. Yes. So they can provide all of that to BMAP, and BMAP yeah. can actually match it with what's being played exactly. uh, in each country. It's a wonderful tool. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So. You said you have some music publisher deals, you have also some deals where you are a sort of service provider, uh, I suppose, where you are basically collecting uh, monies from French collecting societies on the neighboring right side and on the um, um, publishing side on behalf of uh, artists, of the talent. The two sides that are most important to the equation of the work that I'm doing are yes the sub-publishing side and the representation of the neighboring rights. I do have uh, a whole bunch of labels that I represent. That's working out well. It's a, it's a lot of work. I'm sure you must be so good at quantitative and data <laughs> aggregation. Yeah, the work with it, because basically details. that all has to do with, is with metadata. Metadata, yeah. exactly. In do you that, have some, some, do you have some like, software that you use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. build them? Yeah. I have no. I have a software that I that I that actually it's not a software made out for that. Okay. But since I know the software well, I have manipulated the software to work on that side. Oh, fantastic! Uh, but I'm most also have, it takes a lot of uh, knowledge of Excel. Uh, funny enough, but yeah. uh, it takes because you, sometimes you have to get like formulas and. Uh, and the formulas get quite complicated in order to recognize the tracks. Uh, so there's, there's quite a, a bit of work that involves a bit, a bit of knowledge of, uh, of Windows. Clearly on the neighborhood right side, it, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different uh, beast uh, and a whole different approach from the, from the publishing side. Because quite a few problems. One of the problems is that you're dealing with a lot of people who are claiming tracks that don't belong to them. That's okay. one of the first hurdles that you encounter. The neighboring rights are practically unknown for uh, for people in the United States because since the United States, they don't pay neighboring rights, then they don't have... On, 
uh, you know, that internet play. Like they have they have sound music. exchange, but sound yeah. exchange is basically restricted to yeah. internet radio. Okay, yeah. Having and, said that, uh, though, it's the collecting society for neighboring rights which collects the most money uh, per year. Well, but the size of the country is, yeah, you right. know... Uh, yeah, but I think it's $100 million. I mean, it was $100 million two years ago, and that was the biggest amount uh, of collecting, uh, uh, sorry, neighboring rights collected yeah, but I, but by I'm, any But I'm sure if rights. I look, if you look at it from the perspective of the, for example, the size of France, right. as opposed to the States, I think they collect more here. Oh, you mean like uh, on a proportional... Pro yeah, on a proportional... proportional uh, Level, yeah. yeah. In France, is that they collect a lot, but they don't distribute all because <laughs> a lot of the money. No, because a lot of the money they collect, they can't distribute it because the countries where the recordings were made or where the owners of the recordings oh, are not from, the they're not part of what is called the Rome Convention. No, they do with that pool of money. They just uh, uh, hold it. They hold it on reserves uh, forever and ever. Not forever and ever, but they hold it for a few years, and after uh, five years, they dispose of it. How do you dispose of money? That, that's, no, that's I mean they use it for a, something they, else. They use it for other purposes. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, that makes more sense. No, but the the, the, the purposes are actually quite honorable. They use well, them to fund uh, cultural uh, activities. Yes. They use it to support the members of the societies yeah. here. Yeah. They use it to uh, finance uh, projects, whether it's the budget for an album, the budget for a video, the budget for a tour. But it's a shame that countries, for example like the US don't belong to the Rome Convention yeah. because they could be making it's a, it's so much money they could be recouping so much money I think with the US there's only Iran and uh, I think even China is part of the Rome Convention so I think there's only Iran or something like uh, another country like that we have country which is not part of the Rome Convention so I agree with you. it's really crazy although I don't think with a new Trump administration it's ever gonna happen <laughs> no I don't think so either. where do you see the biggest area of growth in your business in this business of self-publishing and, and you know uh, collecting neighboring rights and publishing rights on behalf of the labels the, uh, the publishers uh, I don't really see a growth per se. Uh, what I see is a different uh, type of income, a different type of revenue. For example, I see the revenue on the publishing side increasing. Really? From where? From what? From uh, performance. Oh, from public that. performance, from public radio, events. from television, uh, from... Uh, but it's not really that that is growing, let's say, to surpass sales. It's just that sales have gone down. Now we're getting performance from other venues where we weren't getting them before. I see. Uh, like what, for it, example? Well, like Spotify and Deezer and oh, okay, uh, okay. iTunes, iTunes Music. Because they're always whining that they don't get enough money from the digital service well, providers, they, they, but they, nonetheless. They don't get enough. But nonetheless, but nonetheless yeah. you know, it's growing because yeah. because the, the growth of the listening yeah. I just I just got my uh, Spotify membership two years two months ago. Uh -huh. I'm really happy with it. I got all this. I mean, I don't want you know I don't work for Spotify, but I, all these playlists and stuff. Um, it's really cool. I really enjoy it. It's very interactive. It's very music. interactive. It's yeah. user friendly. Yeah. It's a uh, it's a wonderful tool. It's, really it's cool. a it's a pleasure to have exactly all the music at yeah. your disposal to listen yeah. to. But really, unfortunately, they don't really uh, it doesn't really pay that much. Yeah. Well, and, they're, st uh, they're still not turning a profit, you know, actually, they're, they, they, they're still in loss. I was just reading a lot of that's, that's, yeah, that's Netflix, what... Netflix, the video streaming company is doing okay. They're now in, uh, turning a, a profit, but still, Spotify is still not. Yeah, that's what they say. So on the streaming side, actually, I mean, like on the neighboring rights side, do you see a real increase with all this um, income coming from uh, streaming? For, for no, because the streaming is not part of the neighboring rights. You only get neighboring well, okay, rights. Well, fine. So you like collected by the collecting society. No, 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 no. The, nothing gets collected on the neighboring rights side that has to do with streaming. Yeah, I know. They don't want to get into it. it. it well, usually, it's a, a direct deal with the uh, with the labels and um, and Spotify or Deezer or. Yeah, well, maybe, but at least on the neighboring right side, then nobody is collecting uh, anything from yeah, Deezer or Spotify. I mean, you're basically collecting is from radios and in whatever shape or form, uh, and you're collecting from sales. 
Yeah, um, I was um, I was invited at Mama two years ago. I think you were in the uh, actually in the audience. Mm -hmm. Jérôme Roger, the um, man, the CEO, I think of. Uh, the French Collecting Society uh, uh, SPPF, SPPF, so for neighboring rights. Um, while we were doing a uh, 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 basically a panel on neighboring rights, he said to me from the outset, "Don't mention streaming." He's yeah. like, "This is the biggest part of the neighboring rights streaming, like in terms of you know dollars and euros which are connected." Is it? Yeah, but we don't deal with it. And this panel is sponsored by SPPF. So, well, actually, the, you know, streaming income is neighboring rights, but it's just that um, the, the collecting societies, neighboring rights collecting societies, are not dealing with this because the labels are um, entering into direct agreements with the, the digital service providers. So collecting societies are not seeing that income. Sure, they, they, they have agreements because they have to provide the content. Exactly. Yeah, that's sure. That is actually affecting the neighboring rights collection. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, and that's why, for example, for big indie labels, they created the likes of Merlin uh, to pull their efforts together so that Merlin would collect, uh, would negotiate an agreement directly with right. the DSPs. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're also working on collecting those neighboring rights, where is the income coming from mostly? Is it from um, TV, radio? For the neighboring rights, the biggest bulk of it comes from public performance. Public performance. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, you get like some what they call the equitable remuneration, or and probably keep it anyway, uh, uh, private copying. Yeah, private yeah. copying. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is the tax that yeah. they get from uh, the companies that manufacture media to yeah. record. That's that's really crazy because I mean, why would you do that today? I mean, like we don't. What? I mean, who, who is doing copy privé, uh, you know, private copying? I'm not using my cassettes anymore. You no, know? no, 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 but that involves a lot of things. It involves computers, uh, hard drives. Well, ten years ago, I would do that, copy some music on my hard drive, maybe I, I might have. But now, with the streaming, why would I sp spend, I don't know how much, how many hours making copies? That doesn't deal with the fact that an individual person is making copies. It's basically, basically, it's under the presumption that if they sell media that allows people to record music, that media should be taxed based on the fact that people can record music onto it. And that includes all types of CD media, like uh -huh. recordable CDs, recordable DVDs, to, you know, USB. Any encouraging words for 2017 for uh, creatives in the music industry? I think basically all the creators should concentrate, at least people who have record companies, uh, they need to concentrate on information. What do you mean? Uh, metadata. On, right. on making sure that all the tracks have the correct information, that you don't assign uh, different ISRC codes to the same recording just because you're putting it on a compilation. You know, make sure that you use always the same information that it, because that's information these days is crucial to get revenue. It's really in the crucial. Term. No, no, and in the short run, <laughs> in, in the, the short, the short term, term too. <laughs> in any case. In any case, that's right. one of the things uh, that they need to do. Are you are you, are you saying that lo a lot of um, right owners are not rigorous enough on this? They they just uh, a bit. Oh yeah, they, they, a bit? They, yeah, they're lacking big time. Yeah, they don't they don't have the first of all they 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 think that the labor of actually assigning information to what they own should be made by an intern or, uh, or, like, or by like a person who has like very limited no knowledge of the business and it's actually totally the so opposite. It's cool. It should be done by somebody who knows what the information is going to be used for because if not all that does is create errors yeah. and the errors get paid in lack of revenue. Yeah. Thing is, it's very time consuming, isn't it? Well, not really. If you do it from the very beginning, it's not. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you one, wait, one album if by you, one album. Yeah. yeah. If you if you Fair wait enough. until you have like a huge catalog to yeah. start assigning information and making sure, yeah, that that, that that can take a long time. But if you're doing it on a regular basis, you know, as you start, sure, that that that, that shouldn't take that long. Anything else that you'd like to add for uh, the music business in 2017? I just keep creating. Oh, yeah. I agree with you. Keep creating stuff. 
so that we can all benefit from it. So, no, so that we can all work. I mean, the most important these days is really to keep the creativity going because there are many aspects in the business that are driving composers, writers, artists away from the business. And that's really a shame because it has become really difficult for them as artists, or as writers, as composers to make money. You know, that drives people away from the from the work. Instead they go to work for in Silicon Valley or London for the tech companies. Yeah, they, I guess the advice is that there are ways to shape your revenue in the music business. It's just not the same as it used to be before and you have to kind of like get updated with the ways of doing it so that you as an artist can keep doing what you do best which is creative. Thank you for listening to our podcast Lawfully Creative produced by Crefavi Studios. Subscribe to our podcast or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube and SoundCloud.